Ah, yes, Julius Randle, the laughing stock of New York Knicks basketball. The laughing stock of all of basketball, if we're being honest. A man who shoots a career 34% from the field in the playoffs. A man who performed so poorly in a three-point shooting contest, he made his six-year-old son shed actual tears. A man who actively has his entire fan base begging to trade him away. And a man who regularly receives boos on his home court. It's Julius Randle against the world, and it's been like that for some time. Through six games of the 2024 NBA season, Randall's shooting an abysmal 27% from the field, and he's doing it in Skechers. Those gritty, hard-working fans of New York are sick and tired of watching this softy fall short every year. Not to mention, they could do without his temper tantrums and the pathetic defensive efforts. I mean, who could possibly want Julius Randall on their basketball team, is something most Knicks fans ponder. If only he were gone, then this team would really succeed. Sure, Randall helped them get to the playoffs a few times, but he's clearly not the guy to get the real job done. He proved that when he left Jalen Brunson hanging in the playoffs last year. If you look at what New York has done and who they have, it seems like this team is on the doorstep of making some serious noise in the league, but it just feels like something or someone is holding them back. Newsflash, the problem is Julius Randle. I mean, it's clear and obvious that he's the issue, right? Or is it? The day is October 29th, 2014. A 30-year-old Carmelo Anthony is ready to take the floor on opening night for the Knicks, fresh off inking a five-year extension with New York this past offseason. Melo recently expressed how excited he was to work in the same organization as the Zen master, Phil Jackson, and why wouldn't he be excited? Phil was recently brought in as president of basketball operations for the Knicks, who desperately needed some playoff success. As a vet who wanted to win now, who better to help Melo chase a chip than the man with 13 rings himself? Well, it turned out anyone could have helped more than Phil. Melo and the Knicks went on to lose that opening night by 24 points, but they also went on to lose 50 or more basketball games that year as well as each of the next four years. A team that was once held to such high regard just a few years ago was now the league doormat. During those rocky seasons, the Knicks obviously had opportunities to build something through the draft. While they didn't know it at the time, those high picks turned out to be very disappointing, to put it lightly. Kristaps Porzingis was an excellent selection, but he ended up leaving the franchise due to the awful management. Other than the unicorn, it was a whole lot of nothing. The Knicks were irrelevant, simple as that. But they weren't going to be irrelevant for long. Fast forward to the 2019 season, 17 wins that year was seen as a blessing for New Yorkers because it was the ticket to a super team the following year. The plan was foolproof, they'd select Zion Williamson first overall in the draft and use their massive cap space to sign Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving to the roster in free agency. And just like that, New York basketball would be relevant again, MSG would be the home of a super team. The late 2010s were a wild ride for Knicks fans, but it was all about to be worth it in the 2019 offseason. Speaking of wild rides, our good friend over on the West Coast was going through his own trials through this time period as well. Julius Randle on opening night 2015 was making his NBA debut against the loaded Houston Rockets. He was recently selected 7th by Los Angeles in the 2014 draft, and alongside an aging Kobe Bryant, Julius was trying to put the Lakers back on the basketball map. Only that plan would have to wait till another year. Julius broke his leg in his first NBA game during a layup attempt in the fourth quarter. Tariq Black's kneecap took him out after playing just 14 minutes of professional basketball. It's a cold world. Anyways, after his recovery, Julius proceeded to play well for the rebuilding LA Lakers, and the great Kobe Bryant had even grown a liking to the tenacious young power forward. Randall in his third full season hit his stride in purple and gold as he averaged a very respectable stat line of 16 and 8. When the 2018 NBA season concluded, Laker fans were intrigued to see their new young core grow together, which included big time prospects like Julius Randall, Brandon Ingram, Kyle Kuzma, and Lonzo Ball. 
You know who else was intrigued by this young core in Los Angeles? LeBron James. Only with Lathanos joining the crew in 2018 free agency, there wasn't enough ball to share between the five so-called studs on this team. Randall realized this, and considering he was already lower on the totem pole when it came to opportunities, he wasn't interested in returning to LA. Things would only get trickier for him to grow as a basketball player with this kid from Akron coming to town. Julius was a free agent in 2018, so he ended up signing a two-year deal with New Orleans, largely due to the recruitment of Anthony Davis. It became clear that Julius wanted to be wanted by an organization, and he felt this kind of love with AD and company. Now, his deal wasn't worth much, as Randall became only the 138th highest paid player in the NBA with his new contract, but in his first season, Julius took a noticeable leap in production. Because of his great 2019 season and his second year player option, Julius could take advantage of his upgraded value and test the free agency market again in the 2019 offseason, which he ended up doing. Now, where was he going to land and for how much money? That was the question. Now that we're all caught up to the 2019 offseason, let's see how the Knicks are doing with building their new super team. The third pick goes to the New York Knicks. Welp, the Knicks are not getting Zion Williamson. But hey, that's only strike one. They still got KD and Kyrie on lock. This is the absolute worst day in the history of the New York Knicks franchise. With the third pick of the 2019 NBA draft, New York selected Zion Williamson's teammate R.J. Barrett. After the initial shock of not getting the first pick, fans in New York realized they still drafted a franchise cornerstone and someone who in many other draft years would have been a first pick. It just so happened that 2019 included ridiculous talents like Zion Williamson and John ja Morant. As for free agency, Julius Randle was what was considered the leftover crumbs of the loaded class, and after striking out on the big dogs, New York scooped him up on a new three-year deal that made Randle the 50th highest paid player in the league. While it wasn't what New York wanted, it was what they got. This team hasn't had a direction in over half a decade, and now with RJ Barrett on board, they had a direction. The front office surrounded RJ with promising young talent, along with experienced veterans to balance out the locker room. Where did Julius fit in this puzzle? No one could be quite sure. It was assumed he'd be a statistical leader for a few developmental years until Barrett was a matured pro, and then if Randall was still on the roster, he'd turn into a nice sidekick for the Duke of York. Regardless of all the speculations going on with this makeshift roster, it was time to roll the ball out on the court and play. As the 2020 NBA season got underway, it didn't take long to realize that the new look Knicks weren't good. RJ Barrett had some cool moments, but he didn't even make an all-rookie team. Julius Randle didn't take any sort of leap statistically, in fact, he was arguably not even the best player on this team. His spotlight was taken by a 30-year-old Marcus Morris who came into the garden, looked like a discount Carmelo Anthony, and then got shipped off mid-season to a contender. Despite the rough year, Knicks fans still had hope for the future, specifically in RJ. He was only 19, and it was expected for Barrett to need an adjustment period in the pros. As for Randall, he didn't have as much support from the fans as it seemed like he regressed from the season prior. He was even given the nickname Beyblade due to his ineffective spin moves. But while it just seemed like poor and awkward play from Julius in 2020, the truth of the matter was that this guy was transforming into a different kind of player. Just two years ago back in Los Angeles, Randall had taken 86% of his shot attempts from within 10 feet of the basket. On the few shots he did take from any sort of range, he struggled mightily. When he signed with New Orleans the next year, he started to incorporate a three-point shot into his diet, which was effective. With that being said, 72% of his shot attempts were still within 10 feet. Now, Julius Randle's in New York, and he's shooting more jumpers than ever, as only 59% of his shots are within 10 feet of the basket. Julius was clearly trying to morph into a modern-day big man who can confidently shoot from outside, but it was even more than that. Randall had gone from a back-to-the-basket big to someone who could now create open looks for himself off the dribble in a face-up. It begs the question, though, why would he change his game so much if he's this clumsy? 
I'm sure he wanted to shoot from distance because that's how the modern game was trending, but the off-the-dribble creation seemed almost dumb for someone of his size to try and do. Not to mention, he had a very weak handle. Randall may have dominated in high school with this type of playstyle, but on the professional level, he just seemed out of place. A possible explanation for this new playstyle is that the Knicks in 2020 didn't have anyone who could create perimeter offense at a high level. Julius may have simply been trying to fill a void. God bless Alfred Payton, but you're not giving a guy like him an ISO possession at the end of a close game. It was assumed that later down the line, guys like RJ Barrett and Kevin Knox would be elite scorers who could fill this role of bucket getter, but for now, these guys couldn't do much against professional defenders. Julius absolutely had his struggles in this new phase of his career, but he did still average almost 20 a night on half-decent efficiency. Was Bucket Getter going to be his role even next year as the young guys develop? Who knows, but this year there was a void, so Julius tried to fill it. I mean, someone had to make some sort of offense. The Knicks in 2020 weren't good enough to make the NBA bubble, and they still didn't really have an identity as a unit. Considering this was only year one of the Barrett Project, though, there wasn't much to worry about yet. Maybe next year, this team could spark something special. Because of the poor record in 2020, the Knicks had a top 10 pick going into that year's draft. With the 8th pick, New York took Obi Toppin, who was not only a potential franchise cornerstone, but also a potential Julius Randle replacement down the line. Their other pick was at 25, and they selected a promising young guard in Emmanuel quickly. Not to mention, New York made a few other roster moves that offseason, and they also gave Tom Thibodeau a 5-year contract to be their new head coach. If anyone was capable of creating an identity of hard work and accountability for this team, it was Tibbs. Before the season kicked off, the Knicks weren't seen as anything more than the same mediocre team, and for valid reasons. Kevin Knox and Frank Nilikina were very close to becoming draft busts, RJ Barrett didn't look stellar in year one, and there wasn't any sort of real star power on the team. I mean, what were these guys supposed to do? According to the experts, the Knicks were going into another year of development, which I guess made sense. The only flaw in their thinking was that they forgot who was coaching this basketball team. Tom Thibodeau doesn't do development years. He wants to win now. And win now, he did. To literally everyone's surprise, when the 2021 NBA regular season was said and done, the New York Knicks were in the playoffs. This was the first time the Knicks were playing postseason basketball since Prime Carmelo was the center of attention in 2013. The hype in the streets was real, not just because of how good the team's record was, but also because New York thought they had the makings of a superstar. Interestingly enough, it wasn't RJ Barrett who took New York by storm, although he did have a pretty good second season. The real hype was about Julius Randle, the 2021 Most Improved Player of the Year, a man who was considered the leftover crumbs of the 2019 free agency class was now second team All-NBA just two years later. And now, he was ready to lead a historic franchise into battle in a playoff series. Julius Randle was superb in 2021. Going back to the continual shift in his shot location throughout his career, Randle was now primarily a jump shooter, and a really good one at that. Julius had become a matchup nightmare as someone who could take advantage of big men in isolation on the perimeter and then punish smaller guards inside. Not to mention, Randle had really elevated his game as a playmaker this season. With the amount of scoring gravity he was starting to put on defenses, Randle regularly found open shooters and cutters for easy looks. He had taken a massive leap in his game, and he was ready to try and lead this team in a playoff series. Well, at least on the offensive side of the ball. You see, Julius Randle was excellent in 2021, but the Knicks' offense as a team was still bottom five in the league based off points per game. Had Randle not taken the leap, this offense would have been G League worthy, easily 30th in the NBA. It's interesting because RJ Barrett and many other players actually shot 40% from three, but still no one else but Julius on that roster could create their own shot. RJ could get himself to the free throw line a couple times, but for the most part, everyone was strictly catch and shoot. Another big problem the Knicks offense faced was that they had really weak guard facilitation. Derrick Rose was brought in mid-season via trade, which really gave New York a boost in these two weak areas, but even then the offense was mediocre. 
So you might be wondering, how could this team be a fourth seed in the East if they have such bad offense? The answer to that question is Thomas Joseph Thibodeau Jr. Julius Randle may have been the face of the franchise in 2021, but the actual leader of this Knicks team was Tom Thibodeau, no questions asked. He took a young, unproven roster with solid defensive personnel and turned them into the number one ranked defense in the league based off points per game. That's the reason this team was the fourth seed in the East. Tibbs played his defensive vets heavy minutes, and they won ball games his way. Guys like Alfred Payton, Alec Burks, Reggie Bullock, Taj Gibson, and Nerlens Noel acted as a brick wall on defense, while the other guys barely put up enough points on the other end to squeak out victories. Tom was so desperate for some offense, he played Julius 156 more minutes than the second leading minute getter in the league, who was his teammate RJ Barrett. Anyways, I've been yapping for long enough. It's playoff time. The city is hype and Madison Square Garden is electric. Let's see how these boys handle the pressure. Uh, so that didn't go very well. But I guess some progress was made. Yes, Julius Randle shot 30% from the field, but the New York Knicks were at least good enough to make the playoffs. It was Randall's first time leading a team in a series like that. This surely won't happen again, right? He may not even need to lead the team again, as RJ Barrett will surely break out into his own stardom soon. In the meantime, though, this Knicks team really is an easy fix. The offense is just struggling, like I mentioned before, and that's why they got bounced by the Hawks. It's clear that they can't create shots from the perimeter. Not to worry, though, they just signed Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier to make it all better. Right? No. <sighs> There's a few different ways that you can look at these moves, some more negative than others, but I'll give you my opinion. By adding Walker and Fournier, New York attempted to attack their flaws, but it was a very poor attempt. Kemba and Evan are some of the worst defenders in basketball, which means when they get on the court, the thing that was once the Knicks' strength now weakens mightily. Offensively, adding Evan to a team that already shot great from three-point range was cool, but it wasn't necessary for the kind of money he was getting. With Kemba offensively, you get someone who can create their own shot and facilitate a bit, but it was known going into this season that his legs were nature valley bars at this point. By the end of the 2022 NBA season, the Knicks missed out on the playoffs, and with their new additions, the offense was not much better than last year. Their defense, though, had taken a pretty big step back. As for Mr. Randall, he really struggled this year. He put up nice stats because he was still leading the charge, but his efficiency took a massive hit. A big issue Randall had against Atlanta in the playoffs last season was handling a double team. It's almost as if he didn't know when to pass or shoot, and when you have the ball in your hands to start most possessions, that's a really bad trait to have. Unfortunately, he needed to have the ball in his hands because of the lack of a facilitator on the court. This is why, personally, I think the Knicks should have paid Mike Conley in the offseason instead of Kemba and Evan, but that's neither here nor there. Randall in 2022 took and missed a lot of bad shots, and he turned the ball over countless times. Nick fans were getting fed up as his temper started to get the best of him, too. It had become clear by the end of the season that Julius was not the star of their future. It was R.J. Barrett. Now, Barrett wasn't exactly spectacular that year either, but he did have a few massive games and won against LeBron James and the Lakers that was very eye-opening. RJ, unlike Julius, seemed to be built for the big moments. All Barrett needed to do to reach his potential was expand his scoring arsenal. He was already great at attacking the rim as he often used his surprising strength to muscle past defenders in the paint. If he could add a nice isolation scoring bag to his game, it was over. This kid already had the head on his shoulders to handle the pressure of New York, something that the current team leader doesn't seem to have. In the 2022 offseason, Nick fans had already waved goodbye to their former All-NBA forward. They saw their future in guys like RJ Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly, and Obi Toppin. Randall was a nuisance at this point. Now, if I were to guess what Randall was thinking at this point in time, I'd assume he regrets how he acted on the court, and I'm sure he knows he didn't play well. The question he's probably asking, though, is why is everyone only blaming me? Derrick Rose was Randall's only playmaking help last year, and he went down after 26 games. Kemba was brought in for some more assistance, but he wasn't much healthier. 
the Knicks' starting point guard responsibilities fell on Alec Burks. Because of this, Randall had a full load of offensive responsibility on his shoulders, and he now had playoff expectations that, in my opinion, were not warranted. Regardless of whatever excuses he could have to validify his performances, his lack of effort and bad attitude just was not right. Body language is contagious to the rest of the team, and someone needed to slap some sense into Randall this season. Despite how badly Knicks fans wanted the big bad man out of New York, it made no sense for the front office to send him elsewhere. His trade value was low, and without Randall, this team would be tanking. Not to mention, they just signed Evan Fournier for the long term, and this team was supposed to be in the playoffs, so taking a development year was out of the question. Instead, the front office needs to revitalize this team, and maybe try to actually fill the void that's been missing on this roster for the past two seasons. Then, maybe the Knicks will be good again. RJ Barrett can rise to stardom, and maybe our old friend Julius Randle can get back to form too. Yeah, that should do it. Because of the disappointments of the previous year, the New York Knicks going into the 2023 season were not expected to do much. Jalen Brunson at the time was considered an overpaid free agent and a mere consolation prize compared to who the Knicks were supposed to get in Donovan Mitchell. Julius Randle at the time was considered a worse basketball player than Al Horford, and RJ Barrett was supposed to be the Knicks' best player, according to the experts. If Barrett emerged to be the all-NBA player he was poised to be, Brunson and Randle could be a nice pair of sidekicks. Randle had proven over the last few years that he was not a Batman-level player, but maybe he'd succeed as a Robin, or even an Alfred. Brunson had an elite playoff run last year with Dallas, so Randall being the third best player on this team might be the most realistic outcome. Randall on the drive, stripped by Butler. Randall gets it back. Randall puts up a three. Bang! Bang! Randall knocks down the three. Randall pulls back. Reed on him. Randall step back three. Bang! Julius Randall with 51. Uh. Never mind. Julius Randle is back. And not just back as in playing well, back as in having the best season of his career. Once again, he's second team All-NBA, but now he's more efficient than he's ever been. With Jalen Brunson at the helm of the offense, Randle's shot profile has changed drastically once again. The bulk of his shots now come from catch-and-shoot three-pointers and drives to the basket. No more of this isolation mid-range nonsense at the end of games. Jalen Brunson was handling that. No more dribbling the clock out wondering if he should pass or shoot the ball. Brunson was now the lead distributor as well. Brunson and Randall are a match made in heaven. Both guys had otherworldly seasons, and no one expected anything like this from either of them. The odd man out in this explosion was surprisingly R.J. Barrett, who through the course of the regular season started to hear his name in trade talks. R.J. was now in year four, and his game hadn't evolved much since he entered the league. He was a streaky shooter who this season was off more times than on. He was an average defender at best, and someone who was very limited as a mid-range creator. Barrett was still nice at attacking the basket, and he was great in transition, but he stalled out frequently when he was asked to create his own shot. He also had tunnel vision at times, and his lack of playmaking prowess led to him taking a bunch of highly difficult and contested shots at the rim. Despite RJ's struggles, the Knicks were rolling and they had another date with the NBA playoffs, this time as a fifth seed in the East. The guys are ready to go and the city is jumping once again. Let's see how this all plays out. I got a pretty good feeling about them this time. <laughs> this man is absolute toast. It was no longer a fluke. Julius Randle sucked in the playoffs. Based off the stat sheet, it didn't even look like he was playing basketball. It looked like he was going on tour. He was awful on offense, awful on defense, and it led to his benching in the fourth quarter of pivotal series-changing games. Once again, New York is faced with the same exact problem. The entire Knicks fan base wants this dude thrown out of the city, but it makes zero sense to trade him. His value plummeted because of the poor play. I mean, who's gonna trade for Julius Randle? 
So now we're here, the 2024 NBA regular season. Julius is still public enemy number one, nothing's really changed aside from his haircut. His shooting numbers are pathetic once again, and his effort is questionable once again. It would seem as if he's the worst basketball player on the planet and the clear problem on the New York Knicks roster. So after all that, it's finally time to address the big question of this video, if it's even a question. Is Julius Randle really the problem for the Knicks? If you want my answer, it's no. Yeah, I said it. Julius Randle is not the problem for the Knicks. In fact, he isn't even close to being the problem for the Knicks. I mean, he does bring problems and can be problematic, which I will explain, but this situation in New York runs a lot deeper than poor playoff performances from their star player. Now, in order for me to get this takeoff, a few things need to be cleared up. There are multiple people who I believe are more of a problem than Randall in the Knicks organization, but I'm not here to attack them. Their names will be exposed, but the purpose of this video is meant to defend Julius Randle. I'm not here to slander anyone. To start my defense, though, I have a list of popular grievances that NBA viewers have with Julius, and I'll tell you my point of view on each of these situations. To start in chronological order with this first point, Julius initially received the playoff choker tag after his series with Atlanta. This was absolutely a fair complaint, but I think a little grace needs to go Julius' way. Now, he should not have been as bad as he was, but since the Knicks' offense was heavily reliant on tough Randall jumpers, it's an easy adjustment to send double teams his way. Either he could try and shoot over the doubles, which when he did, he failed, or he could pass out of the double and let his teammates make offense, which when he did that, his teammates failed as well. Derrick Rose was the only steady hand for New York on offense, and it was clearly because he had the experience to pick apart playoff defenses. Randall that year had no prior playoff experience, this was his first season being a true first offensive option, and at this time in his career, he was just starting to turn into a jump shooter. As I mentioned before, the 2021 Knicks as an offense were not playoff worthy, and it showed when they took the floor. Now, could Randall have made better decisions with the ball? Absolutely, and he is to blame for a lot of the Knicks' issues in that series. I just think it's premature to tear him apart for 2021 considering the circumstances of that team and his role in that offense. If we go to the 2023 playoffs though, this is a different story. It's always going to be a tough listen when a player says, I guess the other team wanted it more, after said player gave poor effort himself in a loss. There's just no excuse for that. But when it comes to Randall's 2023 playoff run in general, there's a lot of context to his poor performances that many people skip over. A lot of people forget that Julius was going into round one versus Cleveland fresh off recovering from a sprained ankle. After playing the first 76 games of the season, Randall sustained the injury in Game 77 and was ruled out until the playoffs started. His return lined up so he could play Game 1 against Cleveland, but when he first got back on the court, he had mixed results. Mostly bad results, though. Fast forward to Game 5, however, Julius played the best playoff game of his career. He took a few early threes that didn't fall, but instead of settling for jumpers like he had in games past, he asserted his dominance in the paint over and over and over again. He picked on Evan Mobley in particular because of how thin he was, and he found tons of success. Because of how badly Randall was hurting Cleveland in the paint, multiple defenders would collapse on him when he drove, and Julius found wide open shooters on multiple occasions, enough to give him six assists in only 16 minutes. He was on pace to have a statistically dominant night, but unfortunately he re-injured his bad ankle before halftime. Just as Julius Randle was finding his groove in the playoffs, he was forced to sit on the sidelines again in street clothes. Because of the re-injury, Julius had to sit out game one against Miami, and when he came back, he once again had mixed results, but mostly bad results. The second the playoffs were over and the Knicks were eliminated though, Julius had his ankles surgically repaired. Now, is this supposed to excuse him for his poor play and bad attitude? Not exactly, but behind everything that happens in this world, there's usually a reason as to why it happens. I'm just trying to provide some context. All that to say, I don't think we've truly seen yet who Julius Randle is in the playoffs. Anyways, the next grievance I want to address is why he seems so clumsy as a basketball player. 
I hinted at it a lot throughout the video, but in my humble opinion, Julius is not supposed to be what he turned out to be. As of 2023, he turned out to be a face-up player who creates off the dribble, but I think he's maximized as an interior force. Now, I have no proof to say that my view of this is objectively right, but I do have evidence to think New York made a big mistake by using Randall the way they did. Julius in 2021 was used as an offensive engine who was relied upon heavily for perimeter offense both in scoring and playmaking. What's interesting about this is Julius Randle is 6'8", 250. Almost no one else in the modern NBA is tasked with doing as much on offense as Randle is at that size. Offensively, many of these 6'8", 250 players are either lob threats, spot-up shooters, or post-up scorers. Even a guy as talented as Kevin Love was never asked to do what Randall was doing on the perimeter. In fact, there's only one player in the league at about 6'8", 250 that is tasked with more perimeter offensive responsibility than Julius Randall. You want to know who that player would be? LeBron James. I don't know if you're getting at my point here, but at that size, it's almost impossible to have the skill, awareness, agility, and ball security that LeBron James has. That's what makes LeBron LeBron. And just a quick news flash, Julius Randle is not LeBron James. With the way the Knicks made Julius play basketball, I think a decent player comparison for him was a drunk version of LeBron James, and if we're being real, that's a serious compliment. Early in his Knicks tenure, Julius was skilled enough to keep his head above the water on a team where he was filling the void on the perimeter because no one else could create anything from there. But just because he was able to fill a role to an extent doesn't mean that's where he fits best on the basketball court. The Knicks as an organization should have seen and known this, which is why I don't blame Randall much for being discombobulated as a playmaker sometimes. Let's face it, unless you're a generational playmaker, a dude that big should not be tasked to handle the ball that much. Randall should have been surrounded with players who can make perimeter offense so he could focus on being a powerful, skilled post player who doesn't need to worry about perimeter playmaking. So when wrapping up the clumsiness point, Julius is clumsy because he is big. The Knicks could limit the times his clumsiness shows if they put him in the post, but because the Knicks sucked a few years ago, Randall had the ball on the perimeter more. Now before we get to the last point, I want to explain how the misuse of Julius Randall is not just on the coaching staff. Starting with Tom Thibodeau though, him wanting to win now with his veterans in 2021 may have worked, but it was at the expense of development. Randall was magnificent and the defense was incredible, but lots of young talent didn't see the light of day in that rotation. Had Tibbs not played his vets so much, he may have had another young player or two break out and become nice pieces to help Randall moving forward. Because that team made the playoffs though, now the front office adds more vets, which means more minutes vanish from the young guys. If they would have done well in 2022, this would have been cool, but the Knicks were pathetic that year. You can put a lot of blame on the front office for adding the wrong pieces to this team. You can also blame them for thinking they could build around a duo of Julius Randle and RJ Barrett and actually win. But looking back at it now, you could perhaps put blame on Barrett for him not becoming the player he was supposed to become. With how nice it's been to see the Knicks actually become relevant again, there's been a lot of issues over these past four years. It just seems like all of those issues are placed on the shoulders of Julius Randle because of how easy it is for people to dislike him. Now that leads us to our last grievance point, which is regarding his poor body language and effort. I'm not about to sit here and defend this man for pouting on the basketball court, and to be honest, I don't think I need to. There's things he could be upset about, for example, Jalen Brunson was brought in just last season and the Knicks already surrounded him with three of his college teammates and also his dad on the coaching staff. Maybe Randall feels like he's getting a special treatment even though this is more of a 1A, 1B situation. I don't really know. Regardless of what the cause is for the moping, it's clearly an issue that needs to be worked out, but I don't think this is who Julius Randall is. I think it's a problem he just has. Usually, guys who give poor effort on defense and mope around the court just want to get their stats and make their money. They don't care about winning basketball games, they just want to be a superstar. Randall has been accused of being this type of person many times, but I think that's incredibly disingenuous. 
Back when Julius signed his contract extension with the Knicks in the 2021 offseason, he took a noticeable pay cut to help get more talent on the Knicks roster. Randall is also extremely vocal when it comes to opposing load management, as just at the start of this NBA season, he was playing on an ankle that potentially wasn't fully recovered from surgery yet. Based off his actions and his past, I would venture to say that Julius Randall cares about the game, and he cares about winning. So in concluding this point, Julius Randle is not perfect, he has problems to work through, but he's also not the big bad man the media makes him out to be. Moving forward, it's impossible to know what the rest of his career brings, but so far in 2024, it seems like the Knicks finally found the secret sauce to truly maximize their star player. After the rugged start partially due to the bad ankle, Randall is starting to dominate in the post, and he's become much less perimeter reliant. When he looks to create off the dribble, he's driving in instead of stepping back, and he's moving grown men out of the way in the process. I think it's incredible to see how he's morphed into a different kind of player multiple times throughout his career, not to mention he's been really good in all of those different playstyles. This bully ball play style in particular though seems much more sustainable for the playoffs. The in-season tournament is much different than the playoffs, but in a competitive environment in Milwaukee, Randall gave Giannis Antetokounmpo 40 points. And it doesn't stop at just Giannis, Randall has been deep frying elite defenders the entire season, and he seems extremely comfortable against any sort of defensive strategy. I genuinely believe that if the Knicks go about this properly, they have a really special piece in Julius Randle. A player with this much skill and power combined is such a rarity in the league, and I truly believe if he plays the way he plays, the narrative will start to turn in his favor. As I was in the process of making this video, New York actually traded RJ Barrett away to Toronto for OG Ananobi, and if they plan on keeping Randle for the long term, I think this move benefits him greatly. Perimeter shooting and defense is exactly what's needed to complement Julius, and RJ wasn't really giving him that. As for now though, I just want to put you guys on the radar. Don't fall for the headlines on your Instagram feed or what Stephen A. Smith screams about on TV. Julius Randle is not the problem for the Knicks.